Hello, I'm Stephen Ballast. Welcome to my channel where I explore worship technology solutions. This video is part six in a series called Make My Livestream Sound Better, where we've been doing just that. In this video, we're gonna continue to use the setup that we've created with an isolated mix in our DAW. If you wanna see how this is all set up, I'd suggest you go back and watch the second video in this series. And then in the third, fourth, and fifth videos, we created all of our routing and added plugins in Reaper, which is the DAW I'm using. In this video, we're gonna answer the question, what is the right volume to send to our live stream? And how do we accomplish that? How do you get a consistent and correct volume sent to your video? First, we need to understand the problem we are addressing and the scope of what we're talking about here. There's more to volume than just hitting a spot on your output dB meter and then you're good. It's not just getting the input at your video switcher or your encoder, OBS, whatever you're using to reach some arbitrary decibel level on its input meter. That's not what we're trying to achieve. Ultimately, we're trying to create an engaging experience for the viewers of your live stream. And there are two things we need to understand to make that happen as it relates to volume. One, we want our live stream's perceived volume to be at or near the perceived volume of other content online. So if someone switches from watching the latest video on YouTube to watching your stream, we don't want a large noticeable change in their perception of the volume. Simply put, they shouldn't have to reach for the volume knob when they start watching your stream. Usually for most churches that use a board mix or aux mix, what the listener experiences is that the perceived volume of their church's live stream is much softer than other content online. And another part of this is that unlike the audience that is live in the room, we don't have control over what volume the listener of our broadcast is actually listening at. Ultimately, that comes down to their volume control on the device they are using, and the listener will set that to a comfortable listening volume and expect to hear and engage with your live stream at that volume. So the relative volume to everything else they hear is important in their perception of your live stream's volume. The second thing is, we want to avoid the listener having to constantly be adjusting their volume up or down throughout the flow of your service. When you change from music to speaking or from one person speaking on a headset mic to another speaking on a pulpit mic, you don't want the listener to have to make adjustments to their volume just to be able to hear the speaker. Then maybe suddenly get blasted when a video is played or the music starts again. We want to maintain a consistent perceived volume within the live stream itself. These are important concepts that need to be understood and dealt with in a broadcast mix to successfully create an audio experience for your listeners that is engaging and not frustrating for them. But these things aren't even on the radar of someone mixing in the room, which is a large part of why I believe you need an isolated separate mix to achieve the best sound possible for your live stream. So let's talk about perceived volume. We don't get to set the volume the listener is hearing, but we do need to send a volume level out that is similar to other things they may be listening to. So in context, our mixers perceive to be at the same volume as the other content out on the internet. In the audio world, there is a measurement specifically for perceived volume, and that is LUFS, or LUFS. LUFS stands for Loudness Units Full Scale, and it's a standardized way of measuring loudness. Apple Music normalizes their content to negative 16 LUFS, and Spotify and YouTube normalize to negative 14 LUFS. Now, just to be clear, YouTube normalizes uploaded content and live streams after they are streamed, but not while it's live. What that means is other content on YouTube will be at a perceived loudness of negative 14 LUFS. So that's a pretty good target for us to use to get our live streams to be perceived as a similar volume to other content. To monitor LUFS in our DAW, we'll insert a loudness meter at the very end of our master bus plugin chain. So if you've been following along with my setup, that's right after the L2 or Loudmax plugin. For Waves, they have the WLM meter stereo. Don't use the plus version, it adds latency. And for a free plugin, I like the Ulean loudness monitor too. I'll have a link to that down in the description of this video. There are two primary readings which are useful when monitoring LUFS, short-term and integrated. Short-term gives us a measurement of the last three seconds. Integrated LUFS is an average reading since the measurement began. In the Ulean plugin, you can click this X to restart that averaging time, and in the WLM plugin, there is a reset button. The settings I like to use in Ulean set the upper color threshold to negative nine, 
and the lower to negative 20. That's kind of the range that we're going to try and stay centered around to keep us close to negative 14. In waves, set the short max to off as it starts at negative 12, which is going to be kind of too close to negative 14. You'll always be getting alerts. And for short min, set it to negative 20. And remember that music is a very dynamic thing. The chorus of a song is going to be at a different perceived volume than a verse or the intro of a song. And that's okay. It's going to ebb and flow. So we're creating a window that we're going to try and stay in. So now practically, what steps can we take to get our mix to negative 14 lefts? My guess would be that without some intentionality in your mix, you're probably not at negative 14. Your first answer might be, well, let's just raise up the faders until we get there, which may be part of what you need to do, but another thing we want to avoid is hitting 0 dB full scale on our output meter, or on our buses or channels as well. That's not only going to cause distortion in our audio signal, but sending 0 dBFS to our video encoder could introduce other compression artifacts that will make it even sound worse. So how do we get more loudness without causing peaks? Let me demonstrate this. I'll start with all my plugins bypassed except the loudness meter, because whether you realize it or not, a lot of the plugins that we've added in our previous videos are there to address this exact issue. In Reaper, if you hold down control and click the little power button above the FX on any channel, it will mute all of your plugins. Then we can unmute our master bus and mute all the individual plugins except my loudness meter. I'll have to bring my faders down so that we're not hitting zero on our output. And what we'll see is that to bring my faders up enough to try and maintain negative 14 luffs, I'm going to hit zero dB and start to distort my output. You may be able to hit negative 14 for a bit, but it's not going to be consistent and you'll end up distorting at some point. The issue is dynamic range, or the difference in volume between our peaks and our troughs. If you look at an audio signal, it may look something like this. If this signal wasn't giving us enough loudness and we turned it up, eventually these peaks are going to hit zero and distort, and these troughs may still not be loud enough. The solution to that is to reduce the dynamic range or the difference between our loudest and softest sounds, bringing our peaks and valleys closer together so that we can bring our overall average volume up, which ultimately increases the perceived volume. So how do we do that? Live mixing is going to be different than post-production mixing. In a studio, we have the benefit of hindsight. Usually the first thing you do to mix a song is prepare your tracks, adjusting gain and using volume automation to get a nice consistent level from your instruments or vocals. We don't have that luxury when we're live. We have to deal with what we're given in the moment, which means in some cases we may have to take the lesser of two evils, and that is compression. The compressors that we've put on our channels even out the dynamics, especially vocals, drums, and bass tend to be the instruments that need the most attention. If you've watched my channel for long, you've probably heard me say it before. One compressor banging away at a channel may accomplish what we want from a volume dynamic range perspective, but it's not going to sound very good. Usually, several stages of compression, with each compressor reducing the dynamics a little bit, will sound more natural. So that's why on our vocals we have two compressors, and then a compressor on the vocal bus, and ultimately a compressor on our output bus as well. All of that adds up to give us a more consistent level. We've reduced the difference between our peaks and our troughs in our mix. And as a side note, and this would have to be a topic for a whole different series of videos, but multiple stages of compression and getting the attack and release time set for what's appropriate for the instrument is a large part of getting your compressors to sound natural and transparent. These same techniques also apply to your speaking mics. Speaking can be very dynamic from loud to soft, so you're going to want to put some stages of compression on your speaking mics and use the same principles to even out those peaks and troughs as well. So now let's turn all of our plugins back on, which will bring all of that compression and evening out of our levels back. Once you've gotten your mix somewhat balanced and where you want it with our compressors on and our channels and buses dialed in, then it's time to go to our master bus. And while you usually want to mix with your ears and not with your eyes, for this step you could actually turn your monitor speakers off or way down. The reason for that is if your monitors have been turned up for you to hear a soft mix, your perception of the actual loudness as the operator isn't going to be calibrated to reality. What we're going to do is let the band play 
and then we're going to open up the loudness meter and the L2 or Loudmax plugin. And we're going to take a look at where our loudness is at. If you've set all your compressors well, you may be close to negative 14 already. But most likely what you'll need to do is bring this threshold down a little, which increases the volume. The way this plugin works is as you bring the threshold down, it's going to bring your volume up until it hits the output ceiling that you've set, and then it will limit the output. I like to set the ceiling to negative 1 or negative 2 so we can avoid 0 dBFS on our output. I know this plugin has a bad reputation for squashing a mix, and that's true if you abuse it, it will. But we don't want to be seeing anything getting attenuated here under normal circumstances. If I pull the threshold way down, it's going to push our volume up and start limiting it at the ceiling, and we'll see a lot of attenuation going on. And yes, that's going to start sounding bad. We just want to use this as the last stage to set the volume that's going out from our DAW, and sure, if you have a big drum hit and you see a little attenuation happen, that's fine. That's what we want the limiter to do. Save us from some peaks. But if you're seeing attenuation all the time, constantly, and you're still not around negative 14 luffs, then you probably need to revisit some of the compression on your channels and try and level things out a bit more first before bringing the volume up on the L2 or Loudmax. One thing I have noticed is that when I first bring the threshold down initially and get my short term to negative 14, it probably means I've gone too far and need to back it off a bit, because that's just a 3 second window. Your average will end up being higher over time. Just keep an eye on it over the course of a song and get that threshold dialed in. Once you've got your loudness in the right range, now bring your monitor speaker's volume back up to a comfortable listening level, and you'll find that now you'll more naturally mix to the correct loudness on your output. I'm going to be adding a couple more bonus videos to this series by popular demand. Keep your eyes open for a video about how to set up hardware fader controls in Reaper, like this X-Touch. One of the most common moves in mixing is this right here, pulling one fader down and bringing another up. You do that all the time when you're mixing and you just can't do that with a mouse. Whether you use a cheap or more expensive solution, I'll show you how to set that up in Reaper. Then also a video about how I've set up pitch correction and control that live in Reaper. I hope you found these videos helpful. Until next time, bye.